I think in the early 60s what we saw was that patients would come in with a heart attack and the only real treatment we had was to give them some morphine and tuck them in bed and leave them for six weeks often before they were then allowed to escape the hospital. So that's what was the standard of care around that time. It was horrendous because people with heart attack were almost fated to die and about a quarter of people died before they reached hospital. And no one really was thinking about how this could be bettered until, you know, we got people like Desmond. Desmond was a stimulus, a big stimulus, in not just Edinburgh cardiology, but in cardiology throughout Britain. There's no doubt that Professor Desmond Julian was a pioneer of cardiology. The work he did in the 1960s, setting up the world's first coronary care unit in Edinburgh, was truly fundamental, shaping modern cardiology for many years to come and helping save and improve countless lives. He was a legend in cardiology because he changed the course of coronary care. Desmond Julian should have got a Nobel Prize for this. I'm not quite sure when and why I decided upon a career in medicine. My mother recorded in her diary that at the age of five, I announced that I wanted to be a doctor when I saw my father bandage my grandmother's knee. Undoubtedly, admiration and respect of my father must have been a major factor. But I must also have shared with him how rewarding it was to feel that you were relieving suffering. As I proceeded through my training, I had to think about what kind of doctor I would like to become. I decided that I didn't have the skills to be a surgeon, and I thought I was better suited to be a specialist. The only part of the body that really interested me was the heart. I cannot imagine any other occupation could be as fascinating and rewarding. I'm Claire Julian. I was married to Desmond for more than 30 years. We met at the British Heart Foundation. I was running the press office when he came there as medical director. And I realized that he was very witty, clever with words. He wanted things to be right, but he was a very good natured, very kind person. He loved trying new things. He was very keen on skiing and he loved new gadgets. He never wanted to be out of date. And I think all that, the fact that he had this inquiring mind made him very determined to actually do the things rather than just advise other people how to do them. The driving force, although he wouldn't want to be pious about it, was that you relieved people's symptoms and you made them feel better. So I think he cared about the patient very much. Desmond and others were looking at how treatment could be expedited and improved. It now seems obvious to us that people would be admitted urgently straight to a unit where everyone knew exactly what they were doing and it would monitor them by the second and have alarms and all sorts of things like that. But at the time, that wasn't the norm. And in fact, it hadn't even been thought about. And it was his concept of having what became known as the coronary care unit a place where people went straight away on their stretcher to this place where everyone was highly qualified, knew about resuscitation, knew about the machines that were needed and were just highly, highly specialist people, give them the best possible chance of recovery. I remember the first meeting about it, really quite dramatic. I was four or five years his junior, at least. He had managed to persuade all of the physicians in the all of the hospital to allow their junior staff to attend a meeting with the object of setting up a coronary care service. And almost everyone turned up at that meeting. He got a very good hearing and people were enthusiastic. He set it up that they all had individual rooms, which was almost unheard of in the old hospitals of the old days with the big open wards. And he managed to carve the side ward into the coronary care unit. It was quite an achievement for the time. I first met him as a medical student, and he was this star up there. And at that time, the first coronary care unit in Europe, which was in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, had been established. The big innovation was with resuscitation. And again, Desmond Julian had a key role in that innovation. He was one of the people in the Royal Infirmary who initiated open chest cardiac massage. 
And one of his patients who survived that was an alumnus of a university in America. And at the time, just an internal paper from there was about close chest cardiac massage. So that was one of the things Desmond took on board in the development of resuscitation. So the key thing about the coronary care unit is you had very well-trained specialist nurses there. You had the ability to defibrillate and you had the patients having continuous monitoring. And it was a revolution because they showed way back in the 60s that there was a dramatic reduction in deaths by doing that. My name is Jade McWilliam. I'm a cardiothoracic staff nurse based in Aberdeen. I was initially born 10 weeks premature. I was doing quite well until it hit about 15 days old and I went into cardiac arrest. And my surgeon at the time, Mr. James Pollock, he did an 11 hour surgery. Once they took away the heart and lung bypass machine, my heart went into cardiac arrest again and he used one finger to massage my heart back to life again. I ended up being two pounds, two ounces when I had my surgery, um, making me believed to be Britain's smallest baby to survive open heart surgery. Since 1961, when Professor Desmond Julian started the coronary care, we've got all these technologies that can pick up what conditions people have and what different treatments they can be offered. All of the nurses and doctors that put so much care and skill um, that saved my life, that I want to kind of give back to those people what they give to me. Cardiac care has come on leaps and bounds just even within the past five years. It kind of puts me at ease almost that when I am in my 40s, 50s, that I'll maybe be in a better place than I would have been if I was born in the 60s. My name's Ian Beatty. I live in Calern in Stirlingshire. Towards the start of 2021, I found that I was I was finding exercise very difficult. I'd always been somebody who enjoyed running, enjoyed walking, but I was finding I was getting out of breath. I didn't feel myself. I was in the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow for nine days, and at the end of that, I was told of a condition called chronic heart failure, which I must admit I'd never heard of before. I've had to stop running. 30 years I've been involved in long distance running, so I'm still involved in other ways, which is positive. I'm the race director of the West Highland Way Race, a race that I've run eight times. And I find it a privilege to be still involved and involved as the race director of. I think if I relate it to my situation, I'm able to lead a perfectly normal life. I've had to make some adaptations, but uh, it's not restricted me at all, being able to do that. I'm very grateful for the treatment and the, the knowledge and experience that has allowed me to lead this normal life. But ever since I've been diagnosed, I've had some fantastic care. That doesn't happen without research, a lot of research, a lot of development. The treatment continues to improve as we go on and no doubt will continue to improve in the future. He's had wonderful foresight to see that research can improve the lives of those in the future. I would say thank you very much for letting me live the life I'm able to live just now. That wouldn't have been possible without all the work that's been put in. My name's Suzanne Aldio. I'm married to Paul and we have a little boy called Zachary. He's three. Just before I turned 30, I started to be unwell. So I was going to the gym and I was getting really lightheaded and dizzy and feeling like I was going to pass out. And because of my family history, they looked into long QT as well. And basically he was like, yep, you've absolutely got it. It's very dangerous. This is a condition you can just drop with. It changed my life to begin with because I was afraid to be alone. I was afraid to go places. What does the future hold? What does life look like? Once I knew it was genetic, it obviously affected my thoughts around having a family. I'd always wanted to be a mum, but I didn't want to put a child at risk unnecessarily. So we actually went for advice from a consultant who met with us and was fantastic at just talking things through. Really their advice was there's not really a reason to not go ahead. If they were diagnosed, they would be treated from birth. So my child will at least be taken care of from the moment they know that they have it. So when Zachary was born, they did the ECG and they told me basically when he was a day old that, that yes, he did. You think you're prepared, but when you're holding this tiny little precious baby, it was still really emotional, do you know? I still felt that fear creeping back in, thinking, oh no, it's not just about me now. I was then fitted with a loop recorder. So although that's not specifically for long QT syndrome, that development was huge and it gave me peace of mind. 
for both of us, we take Nadalol. He can tell me it's Nadalol. He can tell me it's 2.5 mils and it's for his heart. So he, he's getting an understanding of why he takes that. At the moment, what his consultant is saying is he can just carry on, grow and do life and, and pursue his interests. He's a healthy, happy wee boy. The fear that I felt with all the advancements, when I think back to how things were then, it must have been much more frightening. When I was first diagnosed, it almost consumed me and it became, I'm Suzanne, I've got a heart condition, you know what, I've got to be careful, I can't do this. And it was almost a focus on what I couldn't do and what I didn't have. And I don't want it to be like that for him. I want him to be Zachary, I want him to be whatever it is that he enjoys growing up. And I feel already with the advancements, really, I guess my hope for him is just that he lives a happy, healthy, fulfilled life. A modern current care unit is a high-tech, sophisticated, but I think hopefully calm and reassuring to the patients. They're going to get the best shot. They're going to come through this. And as I said, the vast majority, now 99% of people, do extremely well with modern care. But ultimately, it's not gone away. It's still the leading cause of death across the world. We need to do better. What the future holds is several things. Number one is actually stopping heart attacks happening in the first place, so prevention. And there are lots of innovations there with the advent of aspirins and statins. And even for those people that have had a heart attack, we're now looking at drugs that can help the heart heal and improve, and the British Heart Foundation is right at the forefront of doing this. For over six decades, the British Heart Foundation is super proud to have been investing in the world's best ideas and brilliant scientists to make progress in how we diagnose, treat, and care for people with heart and circulatory diseases. And we know that our scientists hold the answer to so many advances. At the moment, we're on the cusp of technical revolutions and using technologies like AI to predict heart attacks before they even happen, or new genetic tools who, for the first time in human history, offer us the potential to cure inherited cardiac muscle conditions. They build on the legacy that Professor Desmond Julian has given us and offer hope to countless families to come. They put so much work into these research projects and it's not just about the heart, it's about the cardiovascular system, so it's helping thousands of thousands of people that do have cardiovascular disease. They're doing more studies, they're, they're working towards change here and that just gives me hope and I think that is the greatest thing that we can have. Be positive because there is treatment there. The treatment is so much better than, say, 50 years ago. You're not alone, and other people have been through that. As I believe that the two most important things in life are good personal relationships and the chance to use one's talents to the best of one's ability, as a consequence of this, I've been regarded as the pioneer of what came to be called coronary care units. This has earned me more kudos than I think I deserve because the need for such facilities was so obvious. I count myself incredibly fortunate in my choice of medical specialty. The problem of heart disease has been transformed over the last 50 years. I consider myself both lucky and privileged to have been involved in many of these changes. Desmond Julian was a remarkable man. He's somebody who was able to look ahead and look through the commonly accepted ways of managing things. He was very nice and very kindly and looked after you as he looked after everyone else. Professor Keith Fox, uh, who was uh, my senior, was very much influenced by him in terms of his career progression. Keith passed that on to me and hopefully I'm passing it on to the next generation too because uh, we do need to keep pushing these boundaries to really continue to work on this very solid, excellent foundation that Desmond Julian set up for us. There's an extremely well-known surgeon who wrote in a paper reviewing developments in cardiology over the years and identified creating the concept of the coronary care unit, which Desmond had done, as one of the 10 defining moments in cardiology. And the American College of Cardiology, I'm holding it here, awarded the International Service Award outstanding contribution to enhancing cardiovascular care and education throughout the world. He had very mixed feelings about awards. He was awarded a CBE, which of course he was proud to achieve, but he was very much more delighted by things that were chosen by his peers, where his colleagues thought he was worthy of mention. He loved his time in Edinburgh and the BHF in Scotland. And I think having this memorial lecture, he would really like the fact that his name will live on.
the work of the British Heart Foundation, although it's had enormous success over the years, it needs to continue and it needs to, like coronary care units, save thousands of lives. Thank you.